the chair will reduce to two minutes of time for any electronic vote after the first vote in this series. The unfinished business is a request for a recorded vote on Amendment Number 11, printed in Congressional Record, offered by the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, on which further proceedings were postponed, and on which the noes prevail by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment Number 11, printed in the Congressional Record, offered by Mr. Waxman of California. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request will rise. A sufficient number having arisen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their vote by electronic device. This is a 15-minute vote. The House spent a good part of the day working on the bill that would require the EPA to revise its rules on toxic air emissions from industrial boilers and incinerators, considering some 20 amendments. Roll call votes here on nine of those amendments. This one's from Henry Waxman of California, an amendment to prevent the bill from taking effect if it's not compliant with the House cut-as-you-go rules. This is a 15-minute vote, and the remaining eight amendments will get two-minute votes. An update on what's going on in the Senate. They're voting on the president's jobs bill on whether to move forward with that bill. This is the modified bill that includes a 5% surtax on households earning more than a million dollars a year. But so far, 48 senators have voted enough. That's more than enough to, uh, to block the bill. David Drucker tweets that the modified jobs will fail to move forward in the Senate, anywhere from eight to ten votes short with all of the uh, Republican senators opposing that. The vote will continue. You can follow that on C-SPAN 2, though it's uh, expected possibly to go up till about 9 o'clock, waiting for Senator Jean Shaheen to return and cast her vote. Back here in the House, though, this first vote is 15 minutes, and we're going to show you a news conference from earlier today with the Attorney General Eric Holder. He said today that the U.S. is holding Iran accountable behind a $1.5 million terror plot to murder the Saudi ambassador to the United States. He was joined by FBI Director uh, Mueller and other Justice Department officials in announcing that two people have been charged in New York for the participation in that plot to murder the ambassador with explosives while the ambassador was in the U.S. We'll show you as much of that briefing as we can as this 15-minute vote continues. Good afternoon. Today the Department of Justice is announcing charges against two people who allegedly attempted to carry out uh, a deadly plot that was directed by factions of the Iranian government to assassinate a foreign ambassador here in the United States. Mansour Arbabsiar, a naturalized United States citizen who holds an Iranian passport and was arrested last month in New York, is accused of working with members of an arm of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps to devise an international murder-for-hire scheme targeting the Saudi Arabian ambassador to the United States. According to the complaint filed today in the Southern District of New York, our Bob Siar is alleged to have orchestrated a $1.5 million assassination plot with Golam Shakuri, an Iranian-based member of the Quds Force and other Iranian co-conspirators. Now, the Quds Force is a unit of the Iranian Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. It is also suspected of sponsoring attacks against the coalition forces in Iraq and was designated by the Department of Treasury in 2007 for providing material support to the Taliban and other terrorist organizations. The complaint alleges that this conspiracy was conceived, was sponsored, and was directed from Iran and constitutes a flagrant violation of U.S. and international law, including a convention that explicitly protects diplomats from being harmed. In addition to holding these individual conspirators accountable for their alleged role in this plot, the United States is committed to holding Iran accountable for its actions. Our Babisar and Shakuri are charged with conspiracy to murder a foreign official, conspiracy to use a weapon of mass destruction, and conspiracy to commit an act of international terrorism, among other charges. Our Babisar has been in custody since September the 29th, 2011 while Shakuri, based in Iran, remains at large. Now, according to the complaint, earlier this spring, Arbab Siar met with a confidential informant from the Drug Enforcement Administration who was posing as an associate of a violent international drug trafficking cartel. The meeting, which took place in May and in Mexico, was the first of a series that would result in an international conspiracy by elements of the Iranian government to pay the informant 
$1.5 million to murder the ambassador on United States soil, according to documents that we filed today in court. According to the complaint, those discussions led our Bobby Sarr with Shakuri's approval to facilitate the wiring of approximately $100,000 into a bank account in the United States as a down payment for the attempted assassination. The complaint also states that in the days since the defendant's arrest, he has confessed to his participation in the alleged plot, as well as provided other valuable information about elements of the Iranian government's role in it. The disruption of this alleged plot marks a significant achievement by our law enforcement and intelligence agencies, as well as the close cooperation of our partners in the Mexican government. I want to commend the outstanding work of the agencies that were involved in this investigation, including the FBI and Director Mueller, who is here with us today, as well as the Drug Enforcement Administration and Michelle Lenhart. Their agents and their analysts worked closely with prosecutors here at the Department's National Security Division, as well as in the Southern District of New York, over these many months to monitor this alleged conspiracy, obtain valuable information, and bring one of the primary plotters to justice. I want to thank them for their remarkable work, and I'd like to turn it over to Director Mueller. Well, good afternoon. This case illustrates that we live in a world where borders and boundaries are increasingly irrelevant. A world where individuals from one country sought to conspire with a drug trafficking cartel in another country to assassinate a foreign official on United States soil. And though it reads like the pages of a Hollywood script, the impact would have been very real and many lives would have been lost. These individuals had no regard for their intended victim, no regard for innocent citizens who might have been hurt or killed in this attempted assassination. They had no regard for the rule of law. And with these charges, we bring the full weight of that law to bear on those responsible. And we send the clear message that any attempts on American soil will not be tolerated. Now, this was not a typical case for any of us. Given the global, global, global ties we unraveled and the scope of the plot itself, but it represents the full range of threats we face and it illustrates the need for continued collaboration, collaboration between agencies, departments, collaboration between countries. And we have said it many times before, but it does bear repeating. It is only working side by side that we are able to stop plots like this before they can take hold. We will continue to work together to find and stop those who seek to do us harm, whether they attempt to strike overseas or here at home, whether it is a conspiracy to kill a foreign official on U.S. soil, a terrorist attack on United States citizens, or street crime in our communities. Now let me turn it over to uh, Lisa Monaco. Thank you very much, Director Mueller. I want to echo the remarks of the Attorney General and others here today in thanking those involved in this operation. This is a significant milestone and achievement in our national security efforts. As you have heard, the facts as alleged today in today's criminal complaint shed light on an assassination plot that was conceived and sponsored by elements of the Iranian government. Thanks to a coordinated law enforcement effort, we were able to penetrate and thwart the plot before it could result in harm to the ambassador or anyone else. I want to thank the men and the women of the National Security Division, in particular those from the division's counterterrorism section and other sections within the division, for their efforts in helping to shepherd this case and for their efforts in the extensive coordination that was required to arrive at today's result. This case, perhaps more than any in recent memory, involved an incredible uh, amount of collaboration with partners over several months. Were it not for the hard work of the division and its many partners, we wouldn't be standing here today. I want to thank our partners in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York, for their extensive and hard work on this matter. I also want to acknowledge the work of the prosecutors in the Houston uh, U.S. Attorney's Office and, of course, the many investigators at the FBI, the DEA, and the New York Joint Terrorism Task Force.
They deserve a special commendation for thwarting this plot and obtaining information on those behind it. Finally, I want to thank the intelligence community for its critical role in this matter. The National Security Division was designed to serve as the place where intelligence and law enforcement come together at the Justice Department. I am proud to say that we served that purpose here. This case demonstrates exactly how the division is supposed to work and should serve as a model for future cases. Thank you, and I'd like to uh, introduce the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, Preet Bharara. Uh, thank you, Assistant Attorney General Monaco. Um, as has been described, the complaint unsealed today reveals a well-funded and pernicious plot that had at its, as its first priority the assassination of the Saudi ambassador to the United States. The details of that murder plot are chilling, to say the least, as the defendants allegedly had no care or concern about inflicting mass casualties on innocent Americans on American soil in furtherance of their assassination plan. For example, as set forth in the complaint, when the confidential source noted that there could be 100 or 150 people in a fictional restaurant where the requested bombing would take place, including possibly members of the United States Congress, the lead defendant, acting on behalf of a component of the government of Iran, said no problem and no big deal. And as we allege, the defendants showed that they were more than ready, willing, and able to carry out their plan by, among other things, causing $100,000 to be wired through a New York bank as a deadly down payment for their hired gun. And it didn't stop there. The Saudi ambassador's assassination was allegedly intended to be merely the opening act in a series of lethal attacks cooked up by the defendants and their cohorts in Iran. Uh, like the speakers before me, I want to thank all the partners responsible for unraveling this plot before it ever even got off the ground. Uh, our work, as has been said, uh, is the product of a collaborative effort among intelligence and law enforcement agencies that share an unflagging commitment to keeping Americans safe, both at home and abroad, and protecting representatives of foreign governments while they are guests in our country. I want to commend Director Mueller and the FBI for its outstanding work on this unprecedented and very much ongoing investigation, specifically also the Houston FBI office for its tremendous work and also the New York Joint Terrorism Task Force and our partner in so many cases, uh, Janice Vidarczyk, the assistant director in charge there in the New York office. Uh, I also want to thank the Houston office of the DEA for their important role in this investigation. And of course, the Attorney General and his staff, Assistant Attorney General Lisa Monaco, and our close colleagues at the National Security Division for their tremendous leadership and support. Uh, and finally, I just want to acknowledge the dedicated career prosecutors in my own office in the Southern District of New York, uh, Glenn Kopp and Edward Kim, along with their supervisors, Michael Farbiarz and Jocelyn Strauber, Deputy U.S. Attorney Richard Zabel, and the Acting Chief of the Criminal Division, Jonathan Kolodner. Uh, none of the people that have been mentioned by me and others have gotten much sleep lately and we're all safer because of it. Uh, today's charges should make crystal clear that we will not let other countries use our soil as their battleground. Thank you. Take any questions that you might have? Mr. General, Attorney General. When you say that you're gonna, you say that you're gonna hold Iran accountable, what exactly do you mean by that? Well, we'll be working with our colleagues at the White House, at the State Department, at the uh, Treasury Department, and they will be uh, taking further action, which they uh, will be making uh, more, which they'll be making known uh, in the relatively, over the next few hours. I Just to be clear, though, Mr. Attorney General, to what degree are you saying that the Iranian government was complicit? Did they know about this at the outset? Did they direct it? Did they order it? What exactly are you saying? Well, the organization that uh, I reference in my remarks is uh, a component of the um, Iranian government. Uh, it was, a, we, as we have alleged in the, uh, in the complaint, say that this was directed and approved by elements of the Iranian government and specifically senior members of the Quds Force, which is a part of the Iranian Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and the Iranian military. Uh, high up officials in those agencies, uh, which is an integral part of the Iranian government, were responsible for this plot. Yes, then, that the upper reaches of the Iranian government knew about this and blessed this? We're not, uh, we are not uh, making that charge at this point. Can you talk a little bit more about the other attacks that were to follow, and what is the sort of understood motivation or purpose behind the overall plot as you see it? We are restricting our comments today to that which we, uh, which we have charged in the, uh, in the complaint. 
Why was the uh, why were the charges brought in New York, and were there any charges to be brought in D.C.? Uh, as is the case when you have an international plot that touches a lot of different jurisdictions, cases can be brought in a lot of different jurisdictions. And one of the bases for uh, jurisdiction to be in the Southern District of New York is, as I pointed out in my remarks, that there was a $100,000 payment, which was a down payment on the alleged assassination attempt, and that traveled through a bank in the Southern District of New York. Mr. Attorney General, were there, besides the wiring of the money, what were the other overt acts? Did anybody obtain ex explosives? Well, I want to let Preet go through that, but the answer to that one is no. But <clears throat> The complaint alleges just a couple of overt acts. Um, there are, there's a discussion of conversations that took place, uh, meetings that took place. The complaint does not allege that explosives were actually purchased. Remember, um, as the complaint lays out, the entire time that this operation was being investigated, the confidential source was operating under the guidance and monitorship of uh, FBI and other law enforcement agents. So no explosives were actually ever placed anywhere or, uh, and, and no one was actually ever in any danger. Can you uh, address uh, what uh, role the Mexican government played in uh, the investigation of this? I mean, was, uh, since the subject apparently traveled back and forth there, could you tell us anything about how they were involved? Well, I can certainly say that um, we, as we've all commended the Mexican government for their cooperation um, with us in, in this, uh, helping us uncover the plot, helping us ultimately unwind it. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail as to what the nature of the cooperation was, but it was significant, and I don't think that without it we would have been able to uh, accomplish what we have announced today. Are you, um, are there any other suspects at large in the United States? There's reference here to others who had conducted, or another who had conducted surveillance in Washington with the ambassador. Are there any folks you suspect who are part of this plot still in the United States that you're looking for? We don't have any basis to believe that there are any other uh, co-conspirators present here in the United States. Gentlemen, the question is first, did the Iranian man know the ambassador's favorite restaurant? It says it was discussed. Or was that something that the... Let's vote the yeas are 164, the no 254, the amendment is not agreed to. The unfinished business is a request for a recorded vote on amendment number 18, printing the congressional record and offered by the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, on which further proceedings were postponed, on which the noes prevail by voice vote. Clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number 18, printed in the congressional record, offered by Mr. Connolly of Virginia. Recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request will rise. The sufficient number having arisen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their vote by electronic device. This is a two-minute vote. It's the second of nine amendment votes this evening to the, um, the bill requiring the EPA to revise its rules on emissions, toxic emissions from industrial boilers and incinerators. Through amendments, the Democrats have tried repeatedly to change or alter the bill. This one by Jerry Connolly of Virginia, which is an amendment which would require the EPA not to delay the implementation of regulations for waste incinerators, boilers, or process heaters. Again, it's a two-minute vote and uh, eight more, seven more amendment votes after this, after this, and they will all be uh, two-minute votes, and that will do it for roll call votes this evening. We expect the House to move on to initial general debate on the free trade agreements with Colombia, Panama, and South Korea.
On this vote, the yeas are 168, the noes are 250. The amendment is not agreed to. The unfinished business is a request for a recorded vote on amendment number seven, printed in the congressional record and offered by the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the noes prevail by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number seven, printed in the congressional record, offered by Mr. Markey of Massachusetts. Recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request will rise. A sufficient number having arisen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their vote by electronic device. This is a two-minute vote. Congressman Markey's amendment would add a new section to the EPA bill, which would direct the administrator not to delay actions to reduce pollution emissions. Again, this is a two-minute vote and several more to uh, follow, but the House won't finish action on this bill this evening. They instead will move on to uh, begin general debate on the free trade agreements. Over in the Senate, it looks like the um, uh, president's jobs plan will not move forward. The uh, Republicans have enough votes to, uh, to block that. So far, 48 voting against, including, uh, as of now anyway, two Democrats, John Tester and uh, Ben Nelson, two Democratic senators. They are keeping that vote open, holding the vote open until... Uh, Senator Jean Shaheen returns to Washington and has a chance to cast her vote. You can follow that on our companion network C-SPAN 2 and a tweet from the White House Press Secretary Jay Carney who writes that more political gamesmanship from Senator McConnell tonight. Americans want action on jobs and the economy. Uh, economy. McConnell gives them gorilla dust. That is from Press Secretary Jay Carney and you can go to twitter.com slash C-SPAN to follow more. On this vote, the yeas are 162, the noes. Ms. Waters. Ms. Waters votes aye. Mr. Gutierrez. Mr. Gutierrez votes aye. Mr. David Scott. Mr. David Scott votes aye. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Woodall votes no. This vote, the yeas are 166, the noes are 252, the amendment is not agreed to. The unfinished business is a request for a recorded vote on amendment number two, printed in the congressional record and offered by the gentlelady from Maryland, Ms. Edwards, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the ayes prevail by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number two, printed in the congressional record, offered by Ms. Edwards of Maryland. Recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request will rise. Sufficient number having arisen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their vote by electronic device. This is a two-minute vote. The House has worked on this EPA bill over the course of a, a number of days, mainly considering a lot of amendments. This is a bill that would require the EPA to revise its rules on toxic air emissions from industrial boilers and incinerators. A series of 
of um, eight amendment votes here, four more after this one. This one by uh, Donna Edwards of Maryland would add a finding to the bill which states, according to the EPA, if the rules overturned by the bill remained in effect, they would create over 2,000 additional jobs, not including jobs, created to manufacture and install equipment. Again, it's a uh, two-minute vote. Four more amendment votes will follow this, and then the House will likely move on to general debate on the uh, free trade bills. In political news today, New Jersey Governor Chris Christie endorsed Mitt Romney in his run for president. You can watch that event and lots more on our website, cspan.org slash campaign 2012. That's our road to the White House website. What's more, this evening uh, in New Hampshire, the, the uh, Bloomberg Washington Post debate is getting underway, and uh, that's in Hanover, New Hampshire. We will bring you live coverage of the Post debate spin room. It's expected to start about uh, 10 o'clock Eastern or so, and you can follow that online as well at cspan.org. On this vote, the yeas are 157, the noes are 260. The amendment is not agreed to. The unfinished business is a request for a recorded vote on amendment number one, printed in a congressional record offered by the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the ayes prevail by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number one, printed in the congressional record offered by Ms. Schakowsky of Illinois. Recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request will rise. Suspicion number having arisen. A recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their vote by electronic device. This is a two-minute vote. And another Democratic amendment proposed to the EPA bill limiting toxic emissions, limiting the uh, EPA regulation of toxic emissions from incinerators and industrial boilers. Jan Schakowsky of Illinois uh, her amendment would add a finding to the bill that mercury released into the ambient air from cement kilns is a potent neurotoxin that can damage the development of an infant's brain. Two more amendment votes, excuse me, three more amendment votes will follow after this. By the way, Jen Schakowsky will be our guest, one of our guests tomorrow morning on Washington Journal. She's going to uh, join us to, uh, to talk about the news today from the uh, Justice Department, from uh, Attorney General Eric Holder and Robert Mueller, the FBI director, about the foil plot to kill the Saudi ambassador to the U.S. Jan Schakowsky joining us tomorrow at 745 Eastern. Washington Journal is live every day beginning at 7.
this vote, the yeas are 169, the noes are 249. The amendment is not agreed to. The unfinished business is a request for a recorded vote on amendment number 12, printed in the congressional record and offered by the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Ellison, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the noes prevail by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number 12, printed in the congressional record, offered by Mr. Ellison of Minnesota. Recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request will rise. Sufficient number having arisen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their vote by electronic device. This is a two-minute vote. The bill would require the Environmental Protection Agency to change its rules on toxic air emissions from incinerators and industrial boilers, and Keith Ellison's amendment would require compliance by boilers sooner than the uh, the bill would require. It's a two-minute vote. There are two more amendments to uh, follow this. Over in the uh, Senate, they have blocked the move to the plan to move forward with, with the uh, President's jobs bill. The vote was 50 to 48. NBC Senate producer Libby Leist tweets that the unofficial vote is 50-48. Ben Nelson, Tester Arnaud, Coburn did not vote, waiting on Shaheen to return to D.C. So that vote could be held open uh, until possibly 9 o'clock or so. And on Senator Tom Coburn, the news earlier today, Politico writing that the senator had prostate cancer surgery on Monday in Tulsa and will likely get back to work later this month, according to his spokesperson. The Oklahoma Republican, age 63, has survived two other forms of cancer before. Spokesperson John Hart told the Oklahoma City, Oklahoman that he had surgery to, quote, treat an early stage incident of prostate cancer. So it's Senator Tom Coburn back in Oklahoma this evening. The yeas are 154, the noes are 261. The amendment is not agreed to. The unfinished business is a request for a recorded vote on amendment number 19, printed in the congressional record and offered by the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the noes prevail by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number 19, printed in the congressional record, offered by Mr. Welch of Vermont. Recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request will rise. Sufficient number having arisen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their vote by electronic device. This is a two-minute vote. Peter Welch of Vermont offers an amendment to the EPA emissions bill that would add a finding section to the bill stating that people are exposed to mercury emitted by boiler incinerators and process heaters through the consumption of fish in every state in the nation and has issued at least one mercury advisory for fish consumption. One more two-minute amendment vote will follow th this, and that'll do it for roll call votes this evening in the House. There is political coverage this evening in New Hampshire. There's the uh, debate in Hanover, New Hampshire, Republican presidential candidates debate. After that debate tonight at 10, we're going to bring you coverage live from the spin room, and that will be live, we can tell you, at about 10 o'clock Eastern on cspan.org.
This vote, there are 169 yeas, 249 nays. The, men, the amendment is not adopted. The unfinished business is the request for a recorded vote on amendment number three, printed in the congressional record offered by the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the noes prevailed by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number three, printed in the congressional record, offered by Ms. Jackson Lee of Texas. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. A sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a two-minute vote. And this will be the last recorded vote of the evening and the last amendment vote on the bill requiring the EPA to uh, change its rules on toxic air emissions from industrial boilers and incinerators. Sheila Jackson Lee of Texas has an amendment which would require boilers to comply no later than three years after the EPA completes the rewrite of boiler rules required by the bill. Again, this is the, um, the last recorded vote. And we um, expect the House next will begin consideration of the three free trade agreements with Panama, Colombia, and South Korea, a part of an effort to push through the, through the trade agreements this, will, this week. The uh, Senate is likely to take up the uh, legislation as well. All of this ahead of the, the meeting on Thursday, the joint meeting to hear from the South Korean President, uh, Lee Myung-Bak, uh, Myung who is also visiting the White House, and there's a state dinner plan that evening as well. We'll, of course, have coverage of the uh, of the joint meeting here on C-SPAN on Thursday afternoon.
The yeas are 156. The nays. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield votes no. On this vote, the yeas are 156, the nays are 262. The amendment is not adopted. For what purpose does the gentleman from Colorado rise? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that the committee uh, now rise. The question is on the motion that the committee rise. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. Accordingly, the committee rises. And you'll take that and go over and step okay. by step. Mr. Speaker, the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union, having had under consideration H.R. 2250, directs me to report that it has come to no resolution thereon. The Chair of the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union reports that the Committee has under consideration H.R. 2250 and has come to no resolution thereon. The House will be in order. Gentleman from New Jersey. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, the Chair will postpone further proceedings today on the motions to, susp to suspend the rules on which a recorded vote of the yeas and nays are ordered or on which the number of votes occurs, incurs objection under Clause 6, Rule 20. Record votes on postponed questions will be taken. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I move to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 1263 as amended. The clerk will report the bill. Union calendar number 153, H.R. 1263. A bill to amend the Service Members Civil Relief Act to provide surviving spouses with certain protections relating to mortgages and mortgage foreclosures. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Runyon, and the gentleman from California, Mr. Filner, will each control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield myself as much time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One of the top duties of the Committee on Veterans Affairs is to help enfor enforce and improve Service Members Civil Relief Act, or SICRA, as it is designed to help ease economic and legal burdens on military personnel who are on active duty status. The SICRA is intended to postpone, suspend, or relieve certain civil obligations during a ser service member's period of active duty and accomplish this is in part by regulating certain legal actions against military personnel. H.R. 1263, as amended, makes several changes to strengthen the current protections as it may, as it, <laughs> and it is my pleasure to recognize, as for as much time as you may consume, Marlon Sutzman, the chairman of the Subcommittee on Economic Opportunity, to further discuss these improvements. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank the uh, uh, gentleman from New Jersey for uh, yielding. I also want to thank uh, Ranking Member Fielder and Mr. Braley for helping us move this important piece of legislation to improve the Service Members Civil Relief Act, or SCRA. Earlier this year, allegations surfaced of mortgage-related violations of the SCRA by J.P. Morgan Chase Bank and other lending institutions. These allegations allege that these institutions were unlawfully foreclosing on service members' homes and charging interest rates above the 6% cap required by SCRA. On February 9, 2011, the full committee held an oversight hearing to review these allegations 
and received testimony from Captain Jonathan Rowles, uh, United States Marine Corps, and Mrs. Julia Rowles about the trouble that they had with J.P. Morgan Chase uh, when they had tried to assert their rights under SCRA. They commented that when they called the toll-free number provided by the bank, their employees were woefully inadequate in their knowledge of SCRA, and there didn't seem to be anyone in charge to ensure that the bank was complying with the rules. In response to this hearing and committee's continued oversight of SCRA abuses, Section 2 of this bill clarifies requirements for banks to comply with SCRA provisions related to foreclosures and maximum interest rates. The section requires all lending institutions affected by SCRA to employ and or designate an SCRA compliance officer. This will make it clear that all banks and other lending institutions must take SCRA seriously and have at least one person responsible to ensure their institution's compliance. The section further requires banks that have annual assets of $10 billion to have a toll-free hotline for service members to call and ask questions about their mortgage and SCRA. I want to thank Mr. Johnson of Ohio for originally proposing this provision in H.R. 2329. Sections 1 and Section 3 of the bill expands foreclosure protections under SCRA for service member and surviving spouses. The section prohibits foreclosure and this section prohibits foreclosure within 12 months of a service member coming off of active duty or for a surviving spouse 12 months following the service member's death on active duty or as a result of service-connected injury. When a service member separates from the armed services, they need sufficient time to establish good economic footing to be successful. Some military families experience difficulties often related to owning a home where the service member is stationed in the transition from the military to the civilian world. By providing this expansion, we will be providing more time and options for, estimated, for an estimated 9,000 service members who are estimated to, to be facing foreclosure every year. These are important protections that help our service members and their families who already have given so much in defense for our country and for our freedoms. Once again, I thank the chairman uh, of the uh, VA committee and the ranking member for moving this bill forward, and I urge all members to support H.R. 1263 as amended, and I yield back. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I urge all my colleagues to join me in supporting this piece of legislation. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from California. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, we know how uh, J.P. Morgan Chase and other banks overcharged thousands of veterans and then improperly foreclosed on dozens of families. The most notable case uh, being of uh, Captain Jonathan Rouse and his family who testified very movingly before our committee. Now in the news we have information that some of the biggest banks and mortgage companies have defrauded veterans and taxpayers out of hundreds of millions of dollars by charging illegal fees in veterans' home refinancing loans just, of course, to add to their profits. I think some of those folks who did that did it knowingly. They did it against the law. They ought to be in jail today. But when a service member separates from the armed services, they need sufficient time to establish good economic footing to be successful. We know that at times military families have had a difficult time making a transition from the military to the, to the civilian world. Therefore, we ought to provide enough time for them to work with their lender, get a new loan if necessary, or in the worst case scenario, sell their home. A home is often a veteran's largest financial asset, and they should have an opportunity to capitalize on their equity and avoid a negative mark on their credit history when they have the means to do so with their own home. Mr. Speaker, this is why my bill here will extend mortgage foreclosure protection for a year after separating for, for those who are separating from service and extend those protections to our service members' widows. The bill also includes a requirement for lending institutions with over $10 million in assets to have a compliance officer and a toll-free number for veterans to call. We should require lending institutions to be informed about the protections for our military and have a number that they can call for information and help with their loan. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I would like to yield at this time to the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Braley, uh, as much time as he may consume. The gentleman is recognized. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In May of this year, I introduced the Protecting Veterans Homes Act. After reading the news and hearing in the Veterans Affairs Committee that recently returned soldiers were facing foreclosures on their homes, and I thank the, uh, the chairman of our Economic Opportunity uh, Subcommittee for his inspiring words about this problem. I rise today to talk about the responsibility this government has to protect our heroes who have recently returned from Afghanistan and Iraq. I'm pleased that today the Protecting Veterans Home Act is being considered as part of this bill. We had a legislative hearing on this bill in the Veterans Affairs Subcommittee on Economic Opportunity on July 7th, which I have the honor to serve as ranking member. And that, at that time, we heard from the American Legion, the Reserve Officer Association, the Reserve Enlisted Association, the Paralyzed Veterans of America, the VFW, Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, and the Gold Star Wives of America all acknowledge the need to protect returning service members and veterans from foreclosure and all have endorsed this legislation. This bipartisan bill will help service members who are returning and facing foreclosure stay in their home and ensure that surviving military spouses have additional protections that prevent foreclosure on their homes. Furthermore, this bill establishes that lending institutions have compliance officers to provide information to veterans and service members about foreclosure protections available to them. The Protecting Veterans Homes Act would protect veterans from being foreclosed upon by banks and give those soldiers like the Iowa National Guard soldiers returning from Afghanistan the peace of not mind of knowing that they will have more opportunities to protect themselves from unwanted foreclosures. Too often these soldiers return from combat only to face new challenges here at home. Whether it's due to an injury or a financial crisis caused by long deployments and time off from, our, from their civilian jobs, our veterans deserve to know that we're standing up for them. And this bill will make sure they have time to get back on their feet. Currently, similar protections are set to expire in December of 2012. The Protecting Veterans Homes Act would make these protections permanent and extend the grace period from nine months to a full year for service members and veterans returning from deployments. This will allow them to work with their lenders, secure new loans, secure employment, get over a fa family tragedy, deal with a serious family health issue, or in a worst case scenario, be able to sell their home and avoid possible foreclosure, bankruptcy, or damage to their credit rating. That's why this bill is so important, and I ask all members to, ins to support it. And with that, I yield back the balance, or uh, yield back my time. The gentleman from California reserves. Uh, yes. The gentleman from New Jersey's reserves. The gentleman from New Jersey reserves. Madam Speaker, uh, I have no further speakers. Would uh, urge. Uh, support of the bill and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from California yields back. The gentleman from, California, from New Jersey is recognized for a motion. Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks on H.R. 1263. I once again encourage all members to support H.R. 1263 and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 1263 as amended? Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey rise? Madam Speaker, I move to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 1025. Would the gentleman will suspend a moment? Without objection, the title is amended. Now the gentleman from New Jersey is recognized. Madam Speaker, I move to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 1025. The clerk will report the title of the bill. Union calendar number 152, H.R. 1025. A bill to amend Title 38, United States Code, to recognize the service and the reserve components of certain persons by honoring them with status as veterans under law. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Runyon, and the gentleman from California, Mr. Filner, each will control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey. Madam Speaker, I yield my, myself as much time as I may consume. 
The gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, H.R. 1025 recognizes though we have retired from, from the National Guard and Reserve component of the United States Armed For Forces by honoring them with the status of veterans under law. Representative Walls of Minnesota, the bill's chief sponsor, recently commented, quote, that failure to recognize those who have served 20 years or more in the Reserve and National Guard as veterans represents a gross injustice, end quote. These are men and women who have showed devotion and dedication serving their nation in, uni in uniform for an entire career of 20 years or more in the Reserve and National Guard. These service members were the same uniform as active duty service members, were subject to the same code of military justice, received the same training, and were available for call-up to active duty service at any time. H.R. 1025 confers honorary veteran status on the individuals who are entitled to retire pay for non-regular service or for who would be entitled to retire pay but for age. In addition, this bill ensures those who receive the honorary recognition as veterans conferred in the bill would not be entitled to any statutory benefit under Title 38 or any other title of the United States Code by reason for such recognition alone. Madam Speaker, I would like to yield to as much time as may, he may consume the gentleman from Iowa. Gentleman from